Let's go through the various mitzvot of Purim, how to do them and how not to do them. Of course, you could do malacha on Purim because the rabbis could not forbid malacha. Only Hashem can do that. The first mitzvah we're going to talk about is Kriyat Megillat Esther, reading the book of Esther. Now, this mitzvah sounds easy, right? Because we don't read it. Someone who knows how to read it reads it. He can pile through it in, you know, 30 minutes, 25 minutes. You just go, hear it, and leave. However, as we said last time, it's not that easy to fulfill this mitzvah. Unlike the mitzvah of hearing the Torah, that is an obligation that goes on the kihilah, on the congregation. The megillah goes on the yachid, goes on the individual. That means you have to hear... Let's go through it. So these are mitzvot of Purim. And there will be a uh, mitzvah Purim section on your midterms. Bezrat Hashem. And number one is hear the Megillah times two. You have to hear the Megillah twice. Shh. Once at night time, once during the day. If you miss the night time, what can you do? You miss the night time. It's not daytime. The sun came up. You missed the night time before because you were like, you know, some stupid person who got drunk with all your friends and missed it. Hello? That happens. It's happened to me. What happens if you miss? You can't do anything about it? Done. Chalas. Nothing to do about it. You cannot go twice. There is no... Tashlumin. There is no filling up. If a person misses shacharit, they can pray two minchas. You know that? First one for mincha, and the second one as the tashlumin to fill the one they missed. That's true. That's not true, my Megillah. Why do you have to hear it twice, one and then you only hear it? Oh, because it says in the Megillah, we'll see. It says that there was a mitzvah, that the uh, miracle happened nighttime and daytime, and now the panicking. They're all out. By the way, that's my biggest phobia, being stuck in an elevator with like 15 screaming stern women. Oh, God. I cannot think of anything worse than that. Wow. Wow. Even, even, like, even a three-minute stop would actually freak me out, to be honest with you. Yeah. No. Great question. You do not need to understand it, but you must hear every single word. Very important. So once again, let's just repeat it. If you miss the night time, nothing to do about it. You still get some mitzvah, I think, for going to the daytime, but you've not fulfilled the mitzvah. Um, you have to hear every single word. What people do is they'll follow along in the Megillah. They have to be present. But if you, like with Kriyat Torah, right, you hear the Torah, you want to leave and come back, it's fine because it's not your, uh, you know, not your obligation to hear the Torah. When there's a minyan, the Torah has to be read. But as individuals, you do not need to. We had a question over here somewhere? Hello? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maya Aronson. Um, does, on the day of, is there a particular time that's better? No. Nope. you have to hear it during Shachrit, or you can hear it any You can hear it any time during the day. There are many yeshiva boys who will <laughs> wake up late, unfortunately, and listen to it. You have until the sun sets to hear the Megillah, till Shkiyat Hama. I don't recommend it. But there's always some, you know, some synagogue that's got the late time reading. I had a friend of mine, actually, who uh, dressed up as a chicken. And there was a women's reading, right, late in the afternoon. And he said it because he overslept because he got drunk the night before. Really drunk, unfortunately. And we were kids. And he basically, uh, he turned up and he said, there's all these religious women listening to the Megillah. And him in a chicken outfit completely, like, hung over from the night before. Well, he did his mitzvah anyway. Yeah. What? Me? Of course I dress up. Every year we do a whole family theme. What are you doing now? Talking about. This year, um, usually one of my kids decides. We've had some good outfits in the past. Last year, what did I do? Uh, what did I have last year? I don't know. We did lifeguards one year. We did a whole Arab theme one year. Or like a, probably like a Persian thing, actually, to be fair. That was good. 
Uh, we did a sports thing. I don't know what this year is, actually. I'll see what my uh, kids decide. Yeah, Mai, you have a question? I'll be sending photos, don't worry. I'll show you the full catalogue. Why on Purim are we allowed to hear a woman read a Megillah, but we're not allowed to hear a woman read Actually, they, women have the same. We're going to see that all the myths that we're discussing, women have the same obligation in. Yeah, there's no difference because they also were saved. So although it's a mitzvah, shezman, grama, although it's a mitzvah, all the mitzvot, right, are zman, the time created, or gorem, Right? Even so, even though they're time-bound mitzvot, women are obligated in all the mitzvot because, first of all, Esther was part of it, and also their lives were saved as well. Same reason that women are obligated in all the mitzvot of Chanukah and Pesach, although the mitzvot are Zman Grama. What is a time-bound mitzvah? It can mean a couple of things. It's time by day or time of year. Right? Some mitzvot are daytime mitzvot, right? like to fill in, and some are yearly mitzvot. Right? So the t- it's time, but it's not 24 uh, seven. So we have the same obligation. So if a woman wants to read the Megillah in order to be Yotza, the other woman, she knows how to do it. She's fulfilled her mitzvah. No problem. It works. Okay? Okay. So that's what we say. And we bring children as well to hear the, uh, the Megillah as well. However, if they're loud and disturbed, it actually can be a bit troubling, to be honest with you. However, the, the Minhag Yisrael is to um, bring people to hear the Megillah. Okay, turn to page 44. Let's look at the Shulchan Aruch and the Mishnah Bura. And the Shulchan Aruch says, Chayav Adam lekrot Megillah belayla v'lachzor l'shnot abiyam at night time and day time. Why? Because they cried out at night time and day time, says the Mishnah Bura, v'lachzor l'shnot abiyam, zechel l'nes, to remember the miracle, shayu tzoakim, they cried out, b'yamei tzaratam, yom v'layla. Remember it was like, they were crying out, remember the whole thing, right? With Mordechai and the, the clothing, and he's wearing the, the sackcloth and ashes. So they cried out at nighttime and daytime. So the two readings come to represent nighttime and daytime. Re, um, uh, to fill out. Okay? Uh, the Shulchan goes even further. that this reading the Megillah, although it's a rabbinic mitzvah, actually all these are rabbinic mitzvah, the Rabbanan. However, Mavadlin Talmud Torah. Right? We even Mavata learning Torah in order to hear the Megillah. Okay? How much more so uh, other mitzvot are overridden to hear the reading. So you have to, you go, oh, I'll do a, a Torah mitzvah instead. Right? So I'll ignore this mitzvah because I have a choice. Torah, rabbinic, I'll pick Torah. And the answer is no. No, this is a very important mitzvah. The Jewish people will makabal upon themselves all the mitzvah to pour in and we give them a very high status. There is a concept called, which comes from King Solomon in Mishle, Barov Am, write this down, Barav Am Hadrat Hamelech. Many people doing mitzvot together brings great kavod shemaim, brings great honor to Hashem. Says the Mushpura, we're going to apply this concept of Barav Am Hadrat Melech. We're going to apply this concept to. That's a Dalad, not a very good one, but it's a Dalad. Barov Am, many people, Hadrat, Hadrat, they give great kavod, great honor to the king. King being Hashem. And therefore, says the Mishabura, even if a hundred people are at a home for a Megillah reading, but the community is at the synagogue, it's better to hear the Megillah in synagogue at the same time with a large group. Okay? Because with a multitude of people, Hashem is honest. It's a great Kiddush Hashem. And therefore... You, should tr- you shouldn't be making like little 10 people here and 10 people over there, you know. It works, but that's not what you should be doing. You should actually be trying to hear the Megillah as a community, as many people as possible. Okay? Now let's talk about brachot in general, and let's talk about amen brachot in general. Let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. I just gave a share about this morning, actually, weirdly enough, about the power of answering amen. Amen. By the way, does anyone remember where you saw? I haven't asked the question yet, Maya. Go on then. Go on then. Saying a man is more powerful than the person. That is very true. Making their bracha. That is true. Where in the Megillah? That's what I was, was going to say that too. <laughs> Saying amen is very, very important. And we're going to say amen to this bracha. But where do we see in the Megillah the word amen? It's a tough one. I see the word amen. 
Well, it's pronounced a little differently. Omen Hadassah. Omen. Right? He took care of Hadassah. He took care of Esther. That was Mordechai. Right? He was responsible for that. So Amen, Amen is a, they learn actually that, that um, Esther's success was part of her saying Amen to Brachot. I've heard that. Um, I think I've even read it somewhere once. But that's part of her, her success was saying Amen um, to Brachot. I guess when she was growing up, how many Brachot does she hear when she's in the palace? Okay, so Amen is a sign of faith, right? Now, let's talk about brachot and amen when it comes to this. When you hear a bracha, you answer amen. If you are being yotzed a bracha, you understand what the words mean? If you don't know the words, if you are being, uh, if you're fulfilling your obligation of the mitzvah with that bracha, like the Megillah, you do not interrupt the bracha. But you do answer amen, and you have to have in mind that this bracha is going to cover my obligation. Shomek one. Right? By you listening and saying amen, you are saying amen to the bracha, but you're using it as well. As opposed to someone who's having, a, I don't know, an apple. They say, bracha Hashem, you say, baruch over a you can interrupt it, because you're just hearing a bracha, you say amen at the end, and you're just kind of agreeing with them. That's how a bracha usually works. It's okay to interrupt it, because it's their bracha, not yours. But if someone is making a bracha for you, like Kiddush Friday night, or Hamotzi on Friday night, or Megillah, on Purim, you don't say Baruch Hu over Hashemot when you hear Hashem's name. But you can say Amen at the end. Are we clear? Because you're really interrupting your own Baruch in that sense. But the Baruch is finished, you can answer Amen. Are we clear? So when the Mavarech makes the Baruch, who's going to be the person who reads the Megillah, he's going to say the various Barachot. You're going to listen, you're going to have in mind, I'm Yotzi, this Baruch for this reading, you don't interrupt him with the Baruch Hu when you hear Hashem's name. At the end, you say Amen. Hilchot, Barachot, and Amen. Yeah. What about for Chazarat, like Amidah? Yes, you can. You okay. can say Baruch Hu when you say Hashem's name and Amen at the end because you already fulfilled your obligation saying of saying your own. It's just for those people who don't have it. The custom is to say Baruch Hu and Amen is absolutely okay. Yeah. Very, very good. Yeah. Yeah. Same for Kiddush. You should not, because when you're, whoever makes Kiddush for you at home, when they make it for having you in mind, you're Yotze, therefore you should not interrupt the bracha. You should wait to the end and say Amen, and that's it. So is it like a, like a Tfarbi, like you to do what? Like to say, well, like maybe I'm um, outing my family right now, but like maybe do that. You probably should not do that with all due respect. Okay. During the, uh, the Kiddush. Yeah, not during Kiddush. No. You should wait to the end, say amen, and, uh, and that's it. Where does the custom come from? What custom? Oh, where does it come from? Probably, the beta, probably from the Beit HaMikdash, when they hear Hashem's name, when they say, Blessed be Baruch of Roshama. It's probably where it comes from, yeah. And that's fine to say it. No. No, it does. Many Sidurim will say. Yeah, but sometimes, like, when you don't, like, sometimes you don't. When they was hear Hashem's name, in the, I really go, a lot of this stuff goes back to the, the Mishkan, the Beit HaMikdash, when they hear Hashem's name, and they would prostrate themselves, it would have an impact. Yeah. But you don't have to say it. You don't have to. But here, you're not allowed to say it. Are we clear? Very, very good. Okay, so these are the various brachot you will see. Okay. Gimel brachot, on Mikra Megillah, and on the Nisim, and the Shechianu. So the Shechianu one as well. They'll say Shechianu, and you will answer our to the Shechianu, and have in mind all the other mitzvot of Purim when it's done. So the reader has to have in mind the person he's reading for. You know, once, I remember this, it wasn't Megillah, but I think it was Pasha Zachor. He said the bracha, and then, and he said, oh, you know what? I didn't have in mind that I should cover other people, and he read the whole thing again. That was annoying. So we had in mind to be Yotze, but he's like, the reader's like, oh, sorry, I forgot. We all had to slap back to Shul and hear the reading a second time because he didn't have us in mind. I was like, who doesn't have me in mind? Are you crazy? Do you know who I am? It wasn't enough. Okay. So everyone should listen very carefully, hear every word from the reader. If the reader misses a single word or the listener didn't hear a single word, they don't feel their obligation. So if you go to the bathroom during the Megillah to Esther, that's a bad sign. You haven't heard the Megillah at all. You haven't fulfilled the mitzvah. So I advise you to prepare yourselves before the beginning. 
Okay? Therefore, the custom is to um, have a chumash, to read it from an actual Megillah. Some people read from a scroll. I read from an actual cloth, a scroll. But you don't need to do that. You can read from a chumash or a printed Megillah and follow inside, right? Many people do that so that if they miss a word, they can actually read it themselves and maybe catch up a little bit and, and then resume the listening. That's what people do. So you want to follow along that ideally. Counts. Huh? That it's not great, but it's, it's better than missing the entire thing and not listening again. Yeah, that would work. Yeah. Okay. The custom is to make noise during Hash, um, Haman's name, during the Megillah, to fill the mitzvah of Timche et Zechar Amalek. Do you remember, we have to wipe out Amalek because Haman was Amalek. There's a mitzvah to do that. However, many communities will do it differently. They'll do the first one or the uh, other one. Okay, that's mitzvah number one. Are we clear? So we did the brachot. Have in mind, answer amen to all the brachot, and then you cannot talk right through because... The mitzvah is the entire Megillah. You should not say any words from the first bracha to the end of the Megillah. You should not speak at all. Okay? Third. Awesome. I mean... Like if you're a mother and you bring your kids, and then you have to say... You should try not to speak. It's, it's problematic. It is problematic, yeah. Not during Kirita Torah, but definitely during this. Is there anyone that's not obligated? Everyone's obligated. You have bar bar mitzvah, obligated to the mitzvah. But Everyone. Well, the custom is to bring young children to hear it, but if they want to leave and come back, that's not the end of the world. Then it's not, right? But from the age of Chinuch, which is six or nine years old, they should come. Okay, next. Bringing Mishloach. Six through nine or six? Yeah, oh, no, some, no, no. Age of Chinuch, some say it starts at six, some say it starts at nine. It's probably nine years old. Nine years old. Different opinions. No, st- either it starts at six, seven, eight, nine, I don't know, or it starts at nine, yeah. It's probably nine years old. Avadi Yosef says it's nine, I believe. Okay. Mishloch Manot. We give... What do we give? Foods. Foods. No, the brachot thing is not true. It's a myth. I know. Yeah. Yeah. Wait, it can all be the same brachot. I'll show you. Let's look inside. Okay. So where does this come from? So it comes from Megillat Esther. Look on page 46. <coughs> Yemei mishte v'simcha u mishloch manot ish l're'ehu. We give mishloch manot to each other in order to increase the alcohol consumption. No. Increase the joy. Right? And then we'll talk about matna li'av yonim and giving stuff to poor people. Okay. So let's go through some of the halachot over here. So how do you, page 47. So how does one fulfill this mitzvah? So on the day of Purim, not the night before, on the day itself, you have to send two food items to at least one person. So let's do this. We have Mishloach Manot. Mishloach Manot is sending two food items to one person. That's how you fulfill this mitzvah. Two items to one person as we're going to see, as opposed to matat Yonim, which is going to be one to two people. But the basic mitzvah is mishloch manot, times two, and I'll define what times two means, to one person. Okay? Why is it by day? Why not night time? Why is this mitzvah to be performed during the day? So they have food for the Suda, because the mitzvah of the Suda is by day. So ideally you want to give them that. That's going to be very, very important. You aren't just handing out random items. It's got to be something they can eat during their Suda. But two, I- two, items. two items per person. If you want to add to it, Ashrechem, 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 Yisrael. No problem. But at least two to one person to fulfill the actual mitzvah. Okay? It's got to be something they can eat. Immediately. You cannot give a raw steak. It's got to be something that is immediately edible. They have to eat it or be able to eat it and enjoy it on Purim. Okay? So it's got to be cooked or ready to eat. Yeah? To ensure that everyone has sufficient food for Pesach. Uh, Pesach. For Purim. I'm ready in Pesach, yeah? To increase that. So why do we do What? 
You can get popcorn. You can't get popcorn seeds. No, like I'm saying, like, you, so I've, like, seen people do, like, movie theater themes and stuff. One other stuff, they, you know, they get, like... You know, I don't know if Esther and Mordechai did the whole theme thing back then. I'm not sure. Know, they did, like, a sports theme, theme or a, uh, you know, know or a zoo theme. theme. You can give actual popcorn, absolutely. You cannot give cop- popcorn seeds. So it can't Kernels. Be micro- it can't be microwave. No. Popcorn. Nope. Be... What if you give other, like, two other things? That are oh, added? that's fine. Then you can give whatever you want. Give them a car if you want. <laughs> no problem. Just the initial mitzvah is going to be on the two food items. By the way, just so you know, I know we give whatever we want to whoever we want, but it's not so simple. It's got to be something that generates love. So it depends upon the caliber of the recipient. You should not be giving the same mishloch manot to a, you know, a friend of yours, like an 18-year-old, and to a chashuv person in the community. You know what I'm saying? It's different. It has to reach their level. So you should have, to, you know, you can't just give like, you know, the Rosh Hashiva, like a banana with a uh, lollipop stuck to the side. It doesn't work that way. Right? It's got to match their chashuvah. They should bring them simcha. Right, if someone gave me a banana, I'd be like, well, that's all I get. I wouldn't say, I'd be like, no, oh, thank you. Yourself. Right, but you've got to, it's got to match the level of, um, okay? All of this is to increase love and friendship between Jews. Right, because if you remember, uh, Haman described us as being mufurad u mufuzar, mufuzar mufurad, separated with no achdut. And therefore, what we do is we do uh, things that bring love between us to show Haman and his cohort that we are loving towards each other. Okay? That's the idea behind it. By the way, just so you know, this is written a few places, but I remember Rosh Hashim telling me when I was a kid, he used to say that really the mitzvah is to give to people you're not so in love with. People you may have fallen out of friendship with. People you aren't so close to. It's very easy to give, you know, your BFF, a couple of uh, mishloach manot, but to give it to someone who you don't really like, who annoys you, you know those people? That's who you want to give it to. Oh, then the person who receives it obviously realizes that, you know, there's some problem between us. That's what we give to people we do like as well. It's like a subterfuge, you understand? You cover it over. So you give it to as many people as possible, but really you want to give it to someone who you have like a little bit of um, uh, relationship trouble, brogues, relationship trouble with. Because you want to increase love. It's an opportunity to bring love to people who, you know, maybe wouldn't have been. So you want, really want to add some people into your uh, mishloch manot list who you don't particularly like. Yeah? Okay. It's praiseworthy, says Shulchan Aruch, to spend more money on, mish- on matanot le'aviyonim. That's important. Actually, actually, uh, the amount you give to poor people, which we'll get to in a second, how to fulfill that mitzvah, should be more than you spend on all the Mishloach Manot and your Su'udah. So if you're hosting your student, it's costing you, I don't know, $300, $500, right, or $1,000, like, and you are buying Mishloach Manot, all these theme like to 50, 60 people. By the way, when we first got married, I used to give it to like 100 people, then it went down to 80, you know? now we're down to like 15, I have no patience anymore. They come to the house, they give it to me, we repackage and send it back out again. Okay, it's got a little bit, it's got a little cuckoo. We're on page 47. Okay? So he says, really the amount, so you shouldn't overdo this. You shouldn't overdo this. Uh, you are allowed... Oh, one second. I'll get to that in a second. Okay. Preferably, you should send food that is ready to be eaten immediately and does not require cooking. If one sends a cooked dish of wine or fruit, uh, it can be, so that it can be eaten at the, uh, at the su'uda, at the mitzvah meal. Okay? But raw meat or raw fish, unless it's sushi, I guess, that requires cookies should not be sent. And that's Minhag Yisrael. We don't send raw items in Mishloach Manot. Okay? Two food items must be different. Okay? Two types of drink or a food and a drink. Okay? That's fine. Does not need to be two brachot. So if you want to send a, say, uh, um, a steak and a can of soda, that's fine. Although they both have the same bracha, shakol, that's okay. You fulfill the mitzvah that way. Okay? And it should be... The Be'er Allah says it should be the level of the recipient. Okay? So, what? Um, no, that would be one item. See, two different items. Um, unless it's, maybe in that case, two different bracha would help. Like wine and a drink would probably be okay. 
Potentially, yeah. Better to have two, yeah. You don't need to, but that's pretty better, yeah. Yeah. Okay? Not to the poor part. Uh, uh, the, no, the matali avion, we get to right now, the money you give to the avion, the poor person, should be more than you spent on mishloch manot and the suda. Put together. Put together. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. We're going to see more about this in a second. Yeah. If you were to invite all the poor people in the community or something yeah. to your Seuda, would you have to do that? Mishloch? Would you have to, you still have to do, uh, is that, are you asking me if do you fulfill Mishloch Manot? No. The, um, Matat li avionim, to give them food and money. Yeah. If you have an Evi on your table, you're probably Yotza the Mitzvah. You should have it in mind, but you're probably uh, Yotza the Mitzvah. But I've, I'll be honest with you, Baruch Hashem, there's not too many Evion. Well, there are probably Evion. Evion is a low level. That's like really poor. Right? There's different levels of poor. There's an Ani, there's a Dal, there's an Evion. Evion is pretty poor. Right? These people cannot afford a meal. Right? There are such people out there, obviously, but they're not too, you know, too common. Unfortunately, they're more common in Eretz Yisrael. Um, but if you were to, you could probably fulfill the mitzvah of doing it that way and giving them a meal. Yeah. Yes, for this mitzvah, they have to be, yeah. Yes, to fulfill this mitzvah, it has to be part of your um. So they're enjoying the happy holiday day. So yeah, this have to be Jewish people for this particular mitzvah. You can give charity to non-Jewish people, but this mitzvah involves your own uh, mishpacha. Do they have to be aware that it's... Do they have to be aware that... No, absolutely not. They do not need to be aware at all. I mean, I don't... I give... To most people do not know Evionim, but the head of the community probably does. So the customs become to give the rabbi of the community, and he'll disperse it to people that he knows is an Evion. And that works. But it has to be distributed on the day itself. And it has to be usable. You can't give a check to fulfill this mitzvah. It's got to be Muzuman, ready to go, ready to be uh, used. And food does work for an Evion as well. If you want to give food for Suda, like Elisa said, that would actually work. Yeah. So, uh, obviously we don't live at home, but, you know, under our parents' roof, and I know a lot of things that you still live under your parents' roof, it covers um, that, but also at the same time, you're still college students. Yeah. So your obligation of Sadaka is probably not as high as people who make an income, unless you do make an income as a college student. However, these mitzvot will still apply to you, and you should still probably give mishloch not to bring happiness to people, uh, if your parents are allowed to buy it. And, um, and you should give matat liav yonim. Yeah, you should give something. Uh, can your parents give on your behalf, having you in mind for the mitzvah? So, uh, as long as you're aware of it, that will probably work, actually, yeah. Like, I could tell my parents to give me Yeah. Yep, yep. You can, you, you can use a second or third party to, uh, to distribute the money as well, yeah. They'll have you in mind, yeah. That would probably work. That would work. Okay, Matel Yavionim. So how do we do this? Let's look at some of the laws. Page 49. Do they have to give double? No. No. Okay, so how do you form this mitzvah? So on the day of Purim itself, a person has to give one gift to at least two poor people. So you see the difference? Mishloch Manot. Don't get confused. These are tricky midterm questions. Mishlach manat are two food items to one person. That's the basic mitzvah. When it comes to mat levionim, mat not levionim, gifts to the poor people, then it's um, two gifts, sorry, one amount to two people. Okay? Two poor people need to be affected by your giving. You can give food or money. If you want to give a meal to them that they can eat on that day itself and they're an evion, you fulfill the mitzvah. It doesn't have to... Two poor people. So two poor people have to receive one gift each. How do you find something that's so expensive as one item? What? No, no, no. You just, you give... For a poor person? Yeah, you just give money to two people. Oh, okay. That's all. You just give two people, uh, evionim, poor people, money on the day itself. Okay? But it's only called a... Uh, 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 
something of substance, a gift, a matana, if it's of benefit and substance. Okay, therefore it should be amount of food or the amount of money that can feed a person for a meal. So that would be very dependent on where you are. What would a meal cost you in Manhattan? Kosher meal. What would a meal cost you in, I don't know, China? Right? I mean, you know, in France, you've got to figure out it's, it's location uh, dependent. Really, isn't it? Because how much would a meal cost? It doesn't be a fancy meal. It doesn't be a steak meal. The equivalent of enough, that person can have, you know, a sandwich. What does a sandwich cost in Manhattan, a kosher restaurant? At least 30 bucks. 30 bucks for a sandwich? Well, Not that much. 20 bucks. 20 bucks to get your sandwich, I think. Yeah. Yes, they have to be Jewish. This is, this is uh, Evionim, and you bring happiness to the Jewish people. To fulfill this mitzvah, that has to be Jewish. If you want to give to non-Jewish people, that's fine. That's no problem. But this mitzvah involves your family, involves the Jewish people. And how can we fulfill things like as college students? Like... So, in your case, as a college student, you can... Well, I'll tell you what I do now, because Baruch Hashem, that's for you, Evionim. I will go Erev Purim. I'll go online, find trustworthy organizations that I know about, and I will pay by credit card. And then on Purim itself, these people distribute the money or the equivalent food on the day itself. That is what you want to do. Yeah, you do it beforehand, but it's distributed on the day itself. Yes, that is allowed. As long as the money is distributed on the day itself, that is allowed. 100%. Who? They don't need to. Your money's gone and it's, and it's gone for that purpose. But you said if our parents were doing it for us, we'd have to have money. No, that's fine because they're fulfilling the mitzvah for you, right? But because uh, they're giving money, you know, on your behalf. That's different to actually like giving someone else money to give it for me. That's shalich shalich shal adam kamoto. A person's um, shaliach is like themselves doing it. So when the rabbi or the organization gives the money that day, it's as though you're giving it at that moment. Yeah. Can you send a website? Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a few places I have. I'll put it on the group chat. Yeah. So, what you mean by one item to two poor people is just like one thing of mo- like money? Yeah, money to two people or meals to two people. How much meals, enough food they can have a suda with. How much money, the equivalent of. Right? The equivalent of that we ought to do it. Okay? All right. What do you do in your family? Like, you obviously have older kids. So. They do their own money giving. They do their own. They give their own, yeah. Hundred percent. It's always better to do your own. Or is, but it's still acceptable for your parents. I think so. I think so. Yeah. It's better to spend more on this mitzvah mishlach not on the Purim feast, right? By the way, if you have a choice of poor people, because not all poor people are the same, right? You can have a poor family, which is a great mitzvah, but an orphan, right? A yatom or an almana, a widow, they always get ranked higher, right? Because there's an extra mitzvah to love them in the Torah. And therefore, if you have such individual poor or ger, a convert, that's like, that's top-notch tzedakah giving, right? A poor orphan is like the highest level, okay? Okay, since, uh, by the way, by the way, let's say during the year, someone approaches you for tzedakah. Do you have to give them? Someone comes to your door and says, can I, I come to you in the synagogue and says, can I have tzedakah, please? Now, most of you probably need to go on Shabbat, right? But... The rest wants to go every single day. Someone comes to you in right? Do you have to give tzedakah to every person that comes to the door? I think what I'm saying is that if someone asks you for money, you're allowed to question it. You're allowed to question it, and you don't have to. If you don't want to, right? It's guilt, no guilt. You can decide who you want to give it to. Okay? Hmm? It's like that spielers. What do you mean spielers? Like they're coming to your door, like knocking on. Yeah, you don't have to give them. You mishlach, yeah, right. Mishlach, you do not need to give no, them. You need a dog, and then they don't come. You still won't come to your door. They you don't start... come to my door okay. We have I mean, a dog that sits at the window and barks around. the whole block. He like, skips us. You sign up like, for like people that you have come to your house. Like, you understand right. Your grandparents right. I mean, I know people are very well to give a lot of money, and they have certain hours people can come to them. If they come out of those hours, they don't have to give. You don't have to give. Why? There could be a trickster. There could be a ramai. There could be a trickster as the Gemara. Purim is different. Whoever opetech yad, open their hand, not the limlaw, we give them. Even a small amount. That's why everyone goes collecting on Purim. And it adds to the, uh, the love of the day. That actually is probably not 
this mitzvah of Matli Avion, maybe give it to yeshiva, give it to a friend or kids or something, that's fine. That's just to increase the happiness and joy. Okay? But whoever opens the hand on Purim itself, she's going, therefore, what I do is I go Erev Purim, actually not just Erev, I go like two weeks beforehand to the bank and the bank people know, here come the Jews and they're collecting <coughs> hundreds of dollars in dollar bills. So I will leave with like two, three, four hundred dollars in dollar bills and during the day you just like hand it out. So That's it. All right? and, the, and the people who work in the bank like, oh yeah, I know it's, it's, it's the, dollar, the dollar bill holidays coming up. Good. Kiddush Hashem. Right? Right, right. The OJC yeah. do that. Right, that is a nice thing to do, but you do not fill the mitzvah of Matel Yavoni with that thing. But yes, that would work. It doesn't that would work. work. On the, on that w- on no. Happens. It's a nice thing to do. You're giving whoever comes in, and that's the custom. Okay? Okay. Right, and you don't have to give it yourself. You can give it via a third party. All right. Page 50. The Su'uda itself. The final positive mitzvah on Purim is to eat a festive meal during the day according to, with other people to enjoy it. According to most people now, do you need Lechem Mishnah? Do you know what Lechem Mishnah means? No. Lechem Mishnah is a double loaf of bread. The answer is no. It's not a holiday, right, on the caliber of the Torah holidays where you need to have uh, Lechem Mishnah, a double portion of bread. Everyone's fine, but you have a... A, uh, and it should be a nice meal, okay, that you'll have on Purim Day, okay? And it needs to be, although it's come like a bit of a, you know, everyone gets drunk and hangs out, has a good time, which is all fine and acceptable, but it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a holy meal, okay? And therefore many people, they'll learn a little bit of Torah at the meal, and then they'll get drunk. So if it's a holy meal, why don't they have Lechem Mishnah? The no, Lechem Mishnah the is a sign of a, of a, uh, of a, Torah obligated suuda, which this is not. Oh, because it's a right, right. Okay. Okay. I will mention, I have a few sources over here on drinking wine and alcohol and getting drunk. Okay. So the custom is that we do drink, right, a little bit of wine on Purim if you're over 21. So most of you here are not over 21, therefore, you've never drunk alcohol in your entire lives, obviously except you, because you have to be over 18, because you're from Britain. However, for the rest of you people, anyone here 21 yet? 23. 23? 21. I'd go get drunk now if I were you. 21? Yeah, yeah. Oh, exciting. Your first Purim, first ever alcohol. It's true. What's funny about that? <laughs> okay. So the custom is to, Libesume, have a little bit of alcohol, so you don't know the difference between Baruch, Mordechai, and Arur, Haman. Blessed be Mordechai, cursed be Haman. The custom, however, many people are used to the mitzvah by drinking a little bit and sleeping. Because when you sleep, you don't know the difference either. Therefore, what you should do is have a little bit. However, people have overdone this mitzvah. And although the, the, the Gemara says, Nichnas sod, The wine goes in, the secrets come out. Many people, the wine goes in and everything else comes out, including their lunch. That is not good. Okay? It's a big opportunity, Allah Alayna, for a tremendous Chilul uh, Hashem. Okay, and finally, page 53. I know we jumped a little bit. And it is Shushan Purim. Shushan Purim. So what, for, for drinking um, alcohol, just to have, basically just have a little? A little bit, yeah. Okay, page 53. The difference between blessed be Mordechai and cursed be Haman. Well, That's the level. That? Why do they tell us like, that it, you have to get drunk to be ordered to, to tell, not be able to tell the difference? Like, all the why was that made the stipulation? Why is that known as the... Uh, yeah, but why is that like, oh, Purim's the holiday of getting drunk, when if it's not actually... There is a misfile of drinking a little bit, enjoying like yourself. Drinking a little Nothing bit makes... Than drunk. <laughs> yeah, you don't want to get too, too wasted. Like I, I don't know about in your community, but... The, our police send out, like they know I'm coming, and they send out. Like, yeah, but, but I know it's a big problem. We do the same thing in my community, okay. and it's a big problem. 
and the boys end up acting a little bit too crazy, you know yeah, what I'm saying? Yeah, that's what I mean. Like, how did, if they're obviously learning this in school, that yeah. they learn, but how are they But first of all, who says they're learning this in school? Well, I mean, they're they're taught, but I know kiddos. back when I was taught, it was back in Jewish day school, that, like, I knew that from was the drinking hall. Yeah. But why? It is. There's an element of, because basically, yayin brings simcha to a person's life. It brings you happiness. When you drink a little bit, it should give you a little buzz and you should be happy with, misamech with it. You don't need to. Right? If you're an alcoholic and you can't drink any alcohol, you don't drink it. You do not drink it. If you know you're going to, it is a mitzvah too, but if you know you're going to act stupidly, it's worse to make a chil Hashem, which is a doraita. Okay? Be very careful about that. Okay. Cities that had a walls from the days of Yoshua. Cities that have walls from the days of Yoshua. Well, read the Megillah and celebrate Purim on the 15th of Adar, while the rest of us do it on the 14th of Adar. Okay? And that's, we said already, if you remember, because they fought a day later, right, in Shushan, that was a walled city, and they celebrated a day later. So that's basically the way it works. Today, Yerushalayim falls under this, and in Yerushalayim, they celebrate Shushan Purim, and the day before is not Purim. That's the way they do it in Yerushalayim. Are there any other places that would be considered Shushan Purim? Uh, nowadays, I don't believe so. I know there are other cities that could be, but I don't believe we give the Pesach on those days in Eretz Yisrael. I know that Akko was maybe one of the cities, but we don't have enough information on the only one we... The only one for sure Yerushalayim. Absolutely for sure. Okay? Are we good? Great.